It was the hand of God that brought you here for purpose. An apostolic people is not one person or two people going. An apostolic is all of us going. The apostolic means a people that have taken the gospel and they go with the gospel. Sometimes you go by giving finance. Sometimes you go by sending your trailer or your car. Generosity is key in this season. Great faith that's required and great sacrifice that's required. He wants to grow community like he's never grown before. Deep covenantal relationships. God just shining a light on your life groups. Lighthouse, don't forget. Don't forget, keep contending, keep pushing through, keep fighting, keep praying, keep having communion, keep in fellowship. And how do we fight? We fight on our knees. We fight in prayer. You'll fight for the supernatural. Seeing salvations day after day after day after day in the city. You are a lampstand in the city, in this nation, and in the nations of the world. Get ready to be that apostolic people. Good morning, Laros Church. I hope that video excites you as much as it excites me every time I see it. it uh, <laughs> I haven't looked at it once this week, and now it's just seeing it again. just brings about an excitement in my heart for where we're heading and, and what we're heading into. And um, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Hein. Um, I'm a pastor at this church. Um, I get to lead this church. What a privilege. And uh, once again, we're here together, blessed to be in the house of the Lord, blessed to have worship like we just had. Blessed to be able to hear the word and hear what God is about to say to you. Um, and I really trust that as we, as we preach through this specific topic today, that your heart will be open to receive what God has for you, because it's something amazing. And um, I want to start off with a certain, a certain uh, test or question. And I want to ask, how many of you sitting here this morning actually checked the chair before you went and sat down. Check to see, is it, is it steady, you know? Isn't one of the legs maybe, you know, cracked, and, and if I sit down, I'm gonna fall? Uh, how many of you did that? Uh, just by show of hands, how many of you checked your seats this morning before you sat? I was going to say 99.9% .9 if you didn't, but seeing no hands, I'm gonna say 100% of you didn't check the chairs before you sat down this morning, you had complete faith that the chair would hold your weight. And this is an example of so many aspects of our life which we treat the same. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, gonna to use my father-in-law as an example here, but for some reason, we just, we just have faith in things that can fail us and we don't have faith in things that cannot fail us. And it just seems to work like that. My father-in-law, for instance, um, as he's getting older, he's one of the guys, he's the 0.01% that will check the chair before he goes and sits down. A plastic chair. He, because getting older, it's not as nice falling anymore. I've never met someone in my life that has fallen more because of a plastic chair breaking than he did. And, and for that reason, it took him many times, by the way, he knows that I'm speaking about this. He's very well aware that I'm sharing his story about plastic chairs in the church this morning. Um, but it took him many times of going and sitting down on those chairs that just had the cracks and falling for him to actually start checking the chairs before he sits on them. However, he doesn't check wooden chairs and he doesn't check steel chairs. He has faith that they would last, that they would hold him. And um, I think that's, that's what we do as people. We sometimes have more faith in a chair than we have in Jesus Christ. And the title of my message this morning is, Let's Talk About Salvation. And I'm glad you're all sitting because you're going to need to sit down for this one. But before we start, let's pray. King Jesus, 
Lord, thank you that as I went through this, this preparation this week, Lord, there was this, an excitement that you brought about in my heart to share the message of salvation to the people this morning. And Lord, I pray that as I speak, Lord, may it be you speaking through me. May it be your words spoken through me, Lord. And may the people receive it in a way that you want them to receive it, Lord Jesus. Speak to their minds, Lord. Speak to their hearts this morning. And Lord Jesus, may your Holy Spirit convict us of the things that is true. Convict us of the truth that is in your word, Lord Jesus. And allow us to change the things we have to change, Lord Jesus, that our lives might glorify your name. I pray this in your mighty name, King Jesus. Amen. So salvation is something we all need to understand. That, that message said we're going to be an apostolic people. And for some of us here this morning, perhaps you're not saved and we'll get you saved this morning. And um, perhaps you have been saved for many years. But for us to go out, we spoke about being enabled last week but through generous giving. We, we need to be enabled to go. But if we want to go out, salvation is the first thing we need to understand and we need to be able to explain to others in order for them to also come to the, to the light, in, also, in order for them to also make that decision to say, I choose Jesus. Why else would we go out if it is not to get people saved and into the kingdom of heaven? Amen. You know, salvation is single-handedly the most important decision you will ever have to make in your life. There is absolutely no decision that's more important in your life than choosing Jesus Christ. There's no work decision, there's no life decision that you'll ever have to make that is more important than saying, Jesus, I choose you. I say thank you for what you've done to, uh, for me. And I choose to lead a life glorifying your name. It's a decision between life and death. It's a decision that determines your eternity. No other decision in this world will determine your eternity. The decision to choose Jesus will. John 3 verse 16 to 21 says the following. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates light and does not come to the light, lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out by God. First things first. If we read this piece of scripture, there's a very particular word that I want to highlight this morning. God gave his only son. It is done. It's past tense. He did it. He gave it. Did you know that before Jesus Christ came, people didn't have the choice to choose a free life, to choose a life in Jesus. They didn't have that choice, and there was absolutely nothing they could do to deserve or to earn that did you know that when you were born, there was absolutely nothing that you could physically do to deserve and earn the salvation that Jesus Christ brings? Nothing. He gave His Son in order for us to be able to choose and to make that decision. There's no obligation of law anymore. But there's that decision that we need to make. A decision between life and death. Only that, only that. Jesus Christ was sent in the, into this world not to condemn us. It specifically says that in this portion of Scripture. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. Jesus came to save us. And we need to have a mindset like that. If we have a mindset that Jesus Christ came to condemn us, to condemn this world, we have the wrong mindset, friends. We have to think of Jesus as our Savior and not as the accuser. There's one accuser, and that's the devil. He accuses left, right, and center. God 
sent Jesus Christ to save us. When Jesus came, he lived a perfect life on earth. We cannot dispute that. It's written in the word. He, he came to live a perfect life and he did. And I'm going to tell you why in a second. He died on a cross because people made the wrong choice to crucify him. Or did they make the right, uh, wrong choice? Because it was in the plan of God that Jesus would be crucified. He took all of our sin upon him. He took the sin of the guys that choose to, to sin every single day, and he took the, the sin of the people that lives a righteous life or tries to live a righteous life. He took all of their sins because no one is perfect. Jesus Christ is the only one who can justify us in this world. And you need to be able to explain that to people. You need to be able to say, brother and sister, because you probably don't know their name if it's an outreach, but you need to be able to say, brother and sister, you know what? Nothing you can do, nothing you did, nothing you will do can ever get you to a place where you deserve salvation. But Jesus Christ came. Did you know that? Only Him. He's the only one that can justify you. So was Jesus' sacrifice enough? How do we answer that question? The answer is yes. Jesus, He sacrificed. It was enough. Why? Because God raised Him from the dead. God raised him from the dead, written in the Bible. He sits at the right hand of God as we speak. His sacrifice was enough, because if it wasn't, Jesus would not be sitting next to God, the Father. Come on. If it was enough, what can we do then to share in the justification of what Jesus did? Mark 1 verse 15 makes the following statement. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is, as ha is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's what we can do. Repent and believe. The Greek word, here we go. The Greek word used in repenting is uh, the following word. <laughs> If I say, it, if, there's, if there's scholars in the church this morning and I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, it's okay, all right? The word is metanoio. It's a Greek word that says literally to change one's mind. If the Bible speaks about repentance everywhere in Scripture, it refers to this word which says to change one's mind. And repenting from our sinful ways, it's an inward decision that we make and it is displayed outwardly. When we repent and say, Jesus, I am a sinner, forgive me, it becomes something that is an inward decision which makes it an outward thing that you live, live by. You can see it physically. This guy changed. He changed his mind. He was heading in this direction, which is sin, and he changed his mind, and now he's heading in this direction, which is Jesus. Repentance. It's not when you feel like doing it. I just want to make it clear. This repentance is not a feeling or an emotion. It's a decision. You choose to do it. All right? And it's when, through God's grace, His Holy Spirit convicts you that you decide or to do it or not. And friends, we all have that choice. The Holy Spirit will convict you at some point in your life. And you choose whether you want to, uh, you want to repent or whether you don't want to repent. And woe to those who does not repent. I don't want to be the person who does not repent. Because the Holy Spirit's only going to convict you so many times, friends. And then you're going to be on your own. Who wants to be in that place? No one here. Because you're here. But you need to be able to explain this to others. The prodigal son, he returned home. He didn't feel like repenting and stayed in the mud with the, with the pigs. He changed his mind. Returned to his father. That's what we do when we repent. All right? And then once we have repented, what do we do? There's a very, very um, nice prayer that we have everyone who's saved.
pray. And there's a specific reason we have the people pray that. It's the, the, uh, the sinner's prayer. Because in that prayer, we say you have to believe in Jesus. You have to believe in the name of Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God. You have to believe that He really came to earth. It's not just something you say. You have to believe it. You have to believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. It's impossible, right? You have to believe it. We have to believe that He lived a pure life without sin. Friends, I'm saying not one bad thought. Nothing. Jesus lived a pure life. Impossible, right? He did it. You have to believe it. You have to believe that because he was from heaven, the world, darkness, the demonic forces that reigns and rules over this earth didn't want him alive. And then you have to believe that he truly died, that it was Jesus Christ that died on the cross. No one else. Jesus Christ died on the cross. And we have to believe that his sacrifice was enough for us because he was risen again then we have to believe that He was sent into heaven. He was lifted up into heaven. And He gave us His Holy Spirit to guide us. We have to believe that. If He gave us His Holy Spirit, friends, His Holy Spirit is very much alive in us today. His Holy Spirit is very much at work in us today. We have to believe that. Because if we don't believe that, then we don't believe that He poured out His Holy Spirit on us. We have to believe these things and we have to confess these things with our mouth. And then we will be saved and justified. And I want to re-emphasize, no religious act, not coming to church, not coming to the prayer meeting, not reading your Bible every day, nothing can create this justification that Jesus Christ died for us for. Only repentance and believing. Do you know that? Now listen to this. Something significant that I read. John 3.16 says, Whoever believes in Jesus shall not perish. Romans 10 verse 9 says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Acts 4 verse 12 says, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I picked up something here. All of this is a present tense. Not past tense. God gave His only Son. Belief is salvation. No, is no other name. Present tense. And I can go on quoting one scripture after the other. I quoted three scriptures, but it's all in the present tense. And uh, it tells me that we need to keep on believing. You cannot say, I believe, and then continue with your life. You have to keep on believing. You have to keep on trusting Jesus for your life once you have made that decision that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. It sounds simple to say, believe in Jesus. Confess with your mouth that He is God and you are saved. It seems very simple. But we are living in a world where unfortunately, when we think we say something, it is now a reality in our lives. That's the deception that the devil brought into this world. Do you realize that in the times we live in today, when you say, um, you know, let's not go that route, but when you say that you this, and then, you know, it's a weird thing, but then suddenly you that, and then, it's, what are we living in? What world are we living in? What we say is not necessarily the truth. However, we believe it. Matthew 7 verse 21 to 23 says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. On that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then will I declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. 
Did God know that we're going to live in a world where we say things and believe it's true when it's not? He obviously did. We sometimes think, think that if we say the right things and follow the step by step, you know, we have to do this, then we have to do this, and then ta-da, we're saved. Because the world works like that, right? If you follow the instructions in the book, then you're good. If you're at work and you do what you need to do, only what you need to do, nothing more, nothing less, you only follow those steps, you say the right things, you smile when you're supposed to, almost like in those shows where they say applaud, <laughs> smile. We, th we think that if we do those things, then we're saved, which means we think that if we do, we get. But when Jesus Christ came, he did what we could not do. If we couldn't do it, we will never be able to do it. Why do we try to do it? Do you recognize the deception we've come to live in, friends? I stand here and I can tell you, I love my wife and I love my children. And when someone comes in here and they want to harm, want to harm her, I would give my life to save her. But we think that if we say we love you, we pray for you, uh, you know, God has got this for you, don't worry. We believe that that's true, but we don't go home, put their name on a list and pray for them. When someone comes in with a, with a gun, you're, not, you're gonna run. You're not gonna protect the person that you just said you loved. Why do we do those things? Because we do believe that when we say it, it's true. We love you like a doesn't work like that, friends. True salvation is where we live a life of faith and believe every single day of our lives. It's an ongoing process. I can identify as being saved, but I'm not going to make it on Judgment Day if I don't live according to that. If our lives contradicts what God says we should do, then salvation is a, a little bit far off for us. 1 John 5, verse 1 to 3 says, Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of Him. But this, by this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey His commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. We can say what we want, friends. But if we don't live that life, or if we live that life and it becomes such a burden for us, man, the Holy Spirit has not changed our hearts. Did you know that the moment that you receive Jesus into your life, the Holy Spirit enters your life and changes your heart. So we cannot continue referring back to the good days, you know, the good old days. Because if we have truly accepted Jesus Christ into our lives, it's not the good old days. It's thank goodness the sinful days are over. But we keep on referring to those good old days where we lived in sin. That's not the good old days, friends. My heart has been transformed to point to Jesus. And the things I did in my past, it didn't reflect the life of, that Jesus wanted me to live. It's only when the Holy Spirit changes our hearts that we truly set our focus and our eyes on Jesus and on the things and the commands that he places in his word. And we do it and we live it. And it's not a burden, but it's a joy. Amen. Suddenly the yearning becomes for relationship with God. Suddenly the yearning becomes to read his word and to do the things he says. That's what happens when the transformation comes as the Holy Spirit enters your life when you've given your life to Jesus. And friends, I want to tell you this morning, no one is sin-free. Don't think that that moment that you've given your life to Jesus, suddenly you're sin-free. Because no one is sin-free. 
Only Jesus could live a sin-free life. Romans 3 verse 23 to 24 says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and you are justified by His grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you read what I'm reading there? Do you hear that? I know that we sometimes think that sin is just murdering, stealing, sexual immorality, all of those things. But friends, this, this portion of Scripture tells me that if we go our own way, it's sin. So if you're living a life where you prefer to live a life in your own way and not according to God's will for your life, it's also seen as sin. Have you ever thought about that? The difference is when you've given your life to Jesus and you've received salvation, that you recognize God's will over your life. Because you read your word, you read the Bible, you recognize God's will over your life. A true Christian desires to conform to the things spoken about in the Word of God. And when a, when a true Christian sins, their heart breaks because they've sinned. And it leads them to repentance. That's the sign of a true Christian. And lastly, when you've made the decision that you're going to follow Jesus, you will face trials we spoke about it yesterday in the men's, at the men's breakfast. You will face trials and tribulation when you have accepted Jesus Christ into your life. James 1 verse 2 to 3 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet, when you meet trials of various kinds. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. The devil doesn't want you to be saved. I hope that's not news to you. The devil doesn't want you to live a life where Jesus is the one that you pursue. The devil doesn't want you to live a life where you actually change someone else's life and makes him uh, turn to Jesus. He wants you to do the opposite of what God created you for. And you know what? He will hate it when you truly repent and give your life to Jesus. He will hate it when you go and tell the good news of the gospel to someone else at your work, at an outreach. He, he will hate it. And therefore, there will be trials that comes. But you know what? Every single trial that you have victory over in Christ Jesus is a kick in the, in the stomach. Jesus kicks them in the stomach and he, he flies off. Whatever he does. I don't know what he does. You know? <laughs> Okay, be steadfast in the, in the trials and the troubles and the tribulations that you go through because God has given you enough grace to stand and see them through. Romans 6 verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Did you know that hell was never made for us? Hell was made for the devil and his fallen angels. It's not a place where we're supposed to go. We cannot allow anybody that we have the ability to speak to, to go there. We have to share the good news of the gospel to every single person that we meet. To every single person where God convicts our hearts to share. Our lives need to reflect what God has placed in us in order for no one else to go that way. But one thing must be made very clear to every single person. Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. There is no other way. Only Jesus. He placed this gift at our doors. And we decide whether we open the door and take that gift and open it. It's a decision. 
and many choose not to open it. But we need to, we need to be the vessels of God as an apostolic people that goes out and reminds people of that gift. We need to be those people that lives a life in such a way that people come to us when trouble hits. Because how do we handle it so well? How do we get through all these things? Through Jesus as our Savior, through His grace and His mercy of our lives. Amen? In simple terms, true salvation comes when your heart is turned through faith in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit inside you as you confess and believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. I'll read it again. True salvation comes when your heart is turned through faith in Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit as you confess and believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. Open your hearts to what the Holy Spirit wants to tell you. Spend time in God's Word to be able to know which direction you need to head into and be steadfast in the trials that comes your way. And you know what, friends? <laughs> Jesus will come back for you. Maybe we all just bow our heads. As we all in this, in this place where our eyes are closed, I cannot let this opportunity go by where people sit here this morning and has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and their Savior. And as all heads are bowed, I want to give that opportunity this morning. If you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you have never repented and believed in your heart that He is your Lord and Savior, would you be bold enough to raise your hand for me? All heads are bowed. Thank you. Is there any more hands? Any more hands? Friends, this is a decision of life and death. This is a decision that influences your eternity. If you have not made that decision, don't go out. Put up your hand so that I can see you and I can pray with you and I can lead you to the Lord. Is there anyone else? I saw one hand only. I will be in the visitor center after this while they, while they do communion. Thank you. I see another hand. As we have communion... I want you to please meet me in the visitor center. And my wife and, you, and myself will lead you to the Lord. And you'll have communion with us. Thank you, Lord Jesus. That you have given us the gift of life. Lord Jesus, that we don't have to be in a place where we know we are condemned. But we live freely in you as our Lord and our Savior. Thank you, Jesus, that you, you've given us the, the, the tools and the equipment to go and change this world for your kingdom. Lord, thank you that you've stirred in each and every person's heart sitting here this morning to go and to see someone saved that we know is not saved. Lord, I pray that this message will, will be carried in the hearts of the people, Lord, so that they can give this message to others who is not saved, Lord, so that we can see that darkness is broken over this world and that light comes through you, Jesus. I want to pray, Lord, a protection of your children. I want to pray, Lord, a protection over your people so that we can go and make the difference we're supposed to, Lord. Let us step out, Lord. I pray a boldness over every single person sitting here. A boldness and unashamingly going out and seeing your word spread in this world, Lord. Thank you for the word of being an apostolic people, Lord. I pray that every single person here takes it to heart and becomes that apostolic people, Lord. You are good to us, Lord Jesus. 
You love us, Lord. Undeservingly, you love us, Lord. There is nothing we can do that can separate us from you, Lord Jesus, that can take us out of your hand, Lord, if we chose you. Thank you, Jesus. I pray this in your mighty name. So there's, there's communion tables all around the auditorium, and when we have communion this morning, and we re realize who Jesus is once again, friends, we need to rejoice in the name above all names. We need to rejoice in the King of Kings. Can we, before we do that, just give Him a, an applause, the King of Glory.